I wanted to ask you why much uh, more than in previous generations so many 30, 35, 40 year old men suffer from low testosterone symptoms. Why is that exactly? What's the cause uh, in your opinion? Well, we know that uh, men's testosterone levels have been declining at a significant rate over the last several decades. And Stephen, to be the, the honest answer to that and the direct answer to that is that that decline in men's testosterone levels uh, directly parallels the increase in uh, chemicals that have been produced uh, uh, in the world. Uh, we've had gone from, for example, 50 million tons of, of plastics produced in the 1970s to over 300 million tons now. Uh, we're talking about other chemicals such as pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. Uh, all those are known as endocrine disrupt disrupting chemicals and they have shown to have an impact. You know, you can only test them on animals or, or cells. You can't really give a human a uh, endocrine disrupting chemical and see what it does. So uh, this field of biology is, is in its infancy. It's a brand new field of biology, by the way. But why we are seeing the significant decline in testosterone levels and why we are seeing men with symptoms of deficiency, despite having normal levels of hormones, uh, is directly, in my opinion, due to the toxic environment that we are in. Okay, and does that include um, anticonceptive uh, hormone pills for women? Absolutely. Because that's what I heard, uh, hear a lot. Yes, well, you know, when you start studying endocrine disrupting chemicals and how they affect hormones, what we really, the, the three main areas that they've studied are the thyroid receptors, the estrogen receptors, and the androgen receptors. My actual area of interest is with the androgen receptors themselves, but you know, there's also uh, just as much going on when it comes to stimulating or blocking the estrogen receptors and thyroid receptors uh, along with the androgen receptors that I study. So yes, of course, the birth control in the water is affecting us all. Okay. And um, so e even it's more prevalent than in previous generations, but why is the optimization, the testosterone optimization therapy still such a taboo worldwide? in the United States, in Europe, uh, and so on? <laughs> well, you know, once again, uh, it's something that we're not taught about. Um, we, we have no training. You didn't have any training. I didn't have any training. Nobody that's in medical school right now res is, here, or is getting any training in hormone replacement therapy. And uh, my personal opinion on that is it's politics and economics. Uh, medicine is a business. Uh, hormone optimization is all about preventive medicine. It's about preventing disease and maintaining health. Uh, medicine, the medical uh, community that we're in, we, uh, we depend on people being sick and needing surgeries. I mean, you know, as, as well as I do, if you've been in a hospital, worked around the hospital, that when those beds start getting empty, those people panic. When the surgery centers are not full of surgery, the surgery centers panic. We need sick people. We need to treat, you know, we're trained to treat diseases with medications or surgeries. That's, that's, you know, we're trained by the pharmaceutical companies and that's just the, the way medicine is. Medicine is, uh, we as physicians are trained to diagnose and treat disease, not prevent disease. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's sad really. It is, it is. If everyone were healthy, uh, the, the whole system would implode. And that, that's just the truth. I, I want the listeners to understand that our medicine is big business. Uh, your biggest lobbying group here in the U.S. is the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, they don't want you, they don't want you dead, but they don't want you well either. They need yeah. you on these medications. They, they, they need us to be kind of a, uh, a maintaining a, a healthy sick, if you will. I had even the word healthy, but, but they need, we need to be treating. Now, that's why when you do go to a physician, uh, they they treat your symptoms. They don't really, you know, reverse the disease like we try to do with regard to preventive medicine or hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Have, have you seen our uh, Belgian Minister of Health? I did. I saw a picture and I, and I laughed out loud. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you do a good job with your videos. I enjoy them very much. I mean, yeah, I'm a big nice. fan. I found, you, I found you kind of surfing and I've kind of, uh, I've been following you ever since. I guess you know that. And so I, uh, I always try to give you a shout out anytime I can. Anytime I'm doing an interview nice. somewhere, I always point out that this is a your channel is one that they must watch so <laughs> thanks so uh, what I found very interesting is uh, you talking uh, on the other channels on the podcast about uh, testosterone resistance syndrome 
And right. I, I thought that was very interesting. Can you explain what that is exactly? Well, sure. Uh, you know, what we do uh, when we focus on how we diagnose endocrine disorders or testosterone deficiency, we focus on a lab value, a number. And that number is outside the cell. So you can experience the, a deficiency when it comes to hormone by both extracellular and intracellular mechanisms, meaning things that go on outside the cell and things that go on inside the cell. When we do a lab value, we're simply measuring the amount of hormone in the serum, in the blood. So we need a, a certain amount to exert an effect. So for instance, with regard to testosterone, we of course measure a total testosterone and a free testosterone. A free, the free testosterone represents about one to 3% of total testosterone, but that's the active form. Uh, that's actually what's usable to us as, as men and women. Um, now you can have decreased levels of hormones and those are extracellular mechanisms. Those are what, that's what we see with regard to type one hypogonadism or type two hypogonadism. Uh, also, uh, if we have increase in uh, protein binding, such as albumin or sex hormone binding globulin, they can decrease our percent free testosterone. So we have less that, that are usable. But testosterone resistant syndrome focuses on what goes on in the cell. You know, for testosterone to exert an effect, which essentially is it's anabolic, so it's, it, it's protein synthesis, it has to actually enter the cell. And once it enters the cell, it has to go through several steps in order to exert an effect. Uh, the most important uh, step is the binding to the androgen receptor. Anything that prevents binding to that receptor uh, will not allow testosterone to exert an effect. So you can have as much as you want outside the cell. Once it enters the cell, if it can't actually bind to its receptor, like a key entering a lock, nothing can happen. So it has to bind to the receptor, number one, uh, and we can have an increased number of receptors or decreased number of receptors. We can have decreased receptor sensitivity from a genetic standpoint, but also that's where the endocrine disrupting chemicals come in. They actually bind to those receptors and they block the androgens from actually binding to its receptor so it can exert a response. Uh, the second mechanism, once it binds to the receptors, has to enter the nucleus of the cell where a process called transcription occurs, and that's where a copy of DNA is made. Uh, that copy of DNA is then taken outside the nucleus and then is, goes to, a, to what is called a ribosome, and that's where uh, protein synthesis occurs, and that's called translation. So you've got androgen receptor binding, transcription, and translation, these three major processes that must occur inside the cell before testosterone can exert, can exert an effect. Anything that affects any one of those three processes will cause symptoms of deficiency, even if you have normal levels outside the cell. And we in medicine simply measure what's outside the cell. We do not measure or we can't uh, measure what's going on inside the cell in each human being. So I'm treating these men with so-called normal levels, but have all the symptoms of a deficiency because the problem is in inside the cell, this intra intracellular mechanisms, not what's going on outside the cell. And uh, do you have any idea what the ratio is? of men having uh, low testosterone symptoms with low testosterone versus uh, the other men that have normal levels with low T symptoms? You, you know, uh, that, that's where there's a lot of inter-individual uh, variability when it comes to testosterone levels in general. Uh, you can take two men with the same level, the 600, one can be very symptomatic, the other can have no symptoms at all. And once again, do you really get down to, does one man have more receptors? than the other? Does, is one more sensitive than the others? Does, is one, has one had more exposure to EDCs or is receptors being blocked? So that's, that's where you, know, you, you don't know, but that's where we do treat symptoms. So if I have a man come in, you know, it's not so much the, the initial number that I'm looking at, it's I'm trying to treat his symptoms. Now the endocrine societies, as you know, and other societies will tell you that if those, norm, those levels are normal, uh, that we should look for other causes of those symptoms. So if they come in and they're fatigued and they you know, are too tired to do anything, what's the first thing they're gonna get is an antidepressant. If they can't sleep, they're gonna get something to help them sleep. If they can't get an erection, they're gonna get, you know, uh, something to help them get an erection. We're gonna treat all those symptoms without really getting to the cause. And the reason is, is we're trained to treat a lab value. We've, we've turned into a lab-centric medical society versus a patient-centric. We used to treat patient and their symptoms. Now we treat a lab value, and if that lab value is normal, we do not consider other diagnoses, we just treat symptoms. So, uh, so that's uh, typically what ends up happening. And I think that, you know, 
we did not see this uh, 20 years ago. You didn't see 30 year old men coming in with symptoms of low testosterone. This is a, a fairly recent uh, event that's been occurring over the last several decades, but once again, it directly parallels the increase in our chemical exposure. Yeah, so you agree that the patients with uh, testosterone resistance syndrome should be treated uh, as well? That, that is the only treatment. We are, the, the, the sad state of affairs right now is that you can't avoid the exposure. If you test 100 people, every single one of them will, will have, will test positive for EDCs. Uh, so the only, so we can't avoid, we can't avoid the poison because we don't know half of them that are out there. They're not tested. Uh, we don't know what we're being exposed to. They don't test them uh, in a mixtures. They just test them one at a time anyway. And the way they're tested is not how we're exposed to them. There's a, so there's a lot of flaws right now. And once again, I'll, I'll point out that it's in its infancy. This is a new uh, field of biology. But nonetheless, the treatment is to op you have to outcompete the EDCs for those androgen receptors. If we can't bind to those receptors, then we can't get a response from any hormone. So yes, I believe that that's the, that's the treatment, but you know, until mainstream medicine um, acknowledges the existence of, of what's occurring, then, uh, then we're gonna continue this battle and all these men are going to continue to, to be undertreated or not treated at all, and, and, and they suffer. You know, uh, but you know, uh, I guess turnabout is fair play. What we are starting to experience is what women experience uh, through menopause, yeah. which is, you know, a, which is a terrible experience for them. Uh, they all need to be treated. It's endocrine failure for them. But uh, so us men now are getting a little taste of our own medicine there. Yeah. And uh, what are the testosterone levels? Uh, at the expected testosterone levels at what their symptoms may clear. Uh, well, that, that's probably then above the physiological ranges. That's totally an, an individual uh, response. Since I treat symptoms, then I will start with a dose and I will uh, monitor their symptoms every four to six weeks. And then once their symptoms resolve, whatever that number is, it is. And, uh, you know, typically if you're dealing with a 40, 50, 60 year old gentleman, uh, when I typically see someone that comes in with significant symptoms of testosterone deficiency, uh, their symptoms typically resolve on average. People ask me, you know, I'm not following a number, but they'll ask, what level do you typically see them resolve? And it's typically with a free testosterone level between 30 and 50. Yeah, okay. And that may, and that may translate to it. And these are American numbers, okay? Of course, these are not, not your numbers. You'll have to convert for us there. But, uh, but, the, uh, but that, may, that may correspond to a total testosterone here in the in the u.s to uh be in 12 to 100 to, to 18 1900 maybe and that's considered super physiologic yeah. and as you know uh that as you know what is uh, normal yeah. what was normal before july 17th uh, 2017 is now super physiologic and what that means for your viewers is the testosterone levels normal levels have significantly declined so our new normals are much lower than they were prior to 2017. And prior to 2017, a normal level, upper, li upper limit of normal was over 1,500 uh, in certain labs. Now, the normal level is 916, the high, the high normal. Uh, yeah. but, but what's most important is the low normal has gone from 348 to 264. That means if your testosterone is not less than 264, your doctor will not treat you for testosterone deficiency, even if you're severely symptomatic. And not only will they not treat you, they, they, they make the test, they skew the test, so you will be denied treatment in most cases because a man's testosterone level has what we call a diurnal variation, and that means it's, it's higher in the morning hours. So they force you to test men at 8 o'clock fasting at, on at least two occasions, and they have to fail that test, in other, be, other words, be less than 264 on two occasions in order to, uh, to meet criteria, and most men will not meet that criteria. Yeah, exactly. It's the same numbers here. It's uh, 250 till 950 on the laboratory sheets. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to test it in the morning as well. Yeah. So, so now when we treat someone, if we would have treated them a year ago, and let's say we got their levels up to 1100 and because uh, the normal was 1197 then, uh, that would be completely fine. That's normal. You're, you're within the normal range. Now, if you put somebody at 1100, they're super physiologic. You're doing really bad things because the new normal is 916. So just within one year, you've gone from something that was normal to now being super physiologic and considered taboo. Uh, but you know, us men, even though our testosterone levels are declining, 
we have decreased production. We're not responding to the testosterone we have due to the, the blockage of the receptors. Uh, we, we do, we're not in any less of a need from testosterone than what we needed 100 years ago, though. We, right. we need just as much, maybe more. I mean, of course, I think we need more than we did at that time to outcompete our toxic environment. But instead, uh, we're forced to give men less. You know, I can't tell you the number of men I see that come in that their doctor will only treat them to a certain number. And that number would have been a pathetic number uh, 30 years ago, you know, but now it's considered high or you, or, or you should be well. You know, they, they tell them that, well, you should be well now. Your testosterone level is 500. Well, you know, 500 was, you know, one third from the, from the bottom whenever I was first diagnosed with 1500 being normal. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's become a very restrictive, environment and men are truly suffering unnecessarily yeah yeah it's sad really even, uh, even a young urologist here friend of mine uh, says uh, yeah I only give androgel uh, to treat uh, these uh, low T symptoms and uh, if you want the injections you just go to a transgender clinic really that's just it, it, it's terrible until maybe he goes through it. Maybe he'll be lucky enough like I was to, to experience what that feels like to go through it and he will change his mind. He, he'll definitely change his mind, but it's sad that it would take something like that for that to happen. You know, he's not, even he is not really interested because I, I send him the studies on the testosterone cream, uh, yeah. the scrotal application. I send him the studies and he answered me in the mail. You must be joking. He said, <laughs> well, like I said, there, he doesn't have an open mind. Uh, we're, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, I hope our viewers understand when you're in the, and when you get into the medical system, it's almost like a military system. You're trained very rigidly. You're trained within these very narrow parameters. You know, normal is normal. And, uh, you know, so we don't question authority. It's yes, sir. No, sir. No different than the military. And, uh, and so we come out with a very rigid way of thinking. Uh, we're not open to new ideas. If we've learned it one way, then that's the way it's always going to be. We're not open to uh, to new ideas, and so that that's that's really the problem. And uh, you know, and, and and it is a sad state of affairs. And only the people out there and suffer. You know, until you know they find a physician such as yourself that's well educated in it. But you know, it took you going through it to understand it as well. Yeah, 